but I'm going to start with what is in the name. When we say, I pray in the name of Jesus, why are we saying, I pray in the name? Because most people, you'll ask, why, why do you say that? They really don't know how to answer you on that. So we're going to learn why do we say, I pray in the name of Jesus. In the Bible, your, your name meant who you were. Just like Simon, his name meant to be up and down, not sure. Then he gave his life to Jesus, and the Lord gave his, told him, he said, your name is now going to be Peter, the rock. Not, not the rock, Jesus is the rock. But he said, you're going to be meaning rock, that's what Peter means. And in the Old Testament, Jacob, his, his name means swindler. And the Lord changed his name to Israel, meaning prince of God. The name means a lot of who you are, especially back then with the Jews. Because they say, I'm the son of so-and-so. That's how they knew you. You just didn't say, my name's Jesse. Or you could say, my name's Jesse, son of... And that's the way they did it a lot back then. So the name is a big deal. Exodus chapter 3. This is the names that the Lord has. He has many names. Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said unto God... Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they, shall, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? So this is Moses talking to the Lord. When he went to get up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> he spoke to the Lord. And Moses said, What do I tell them your name is? Who do I say sent me? Verse 14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he, and he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. What did he mean by that? I am. The Lord is whatever you need. That's what he is. If you need love, that's what he, he says, I am love. That's what he's saying. If you need grace, he's saying, I am grace. Okay, you need a savior, I'm your savior. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 this is more names for him. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Now he's talking about Jesus here. A child shall be born, unto a son of a unto us a son will be given. So he's talking about Jesus. So Jesus is going to be called Wonderful. He's going to be called Counselor. He's going to be called the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is all the names for Jesus. For Jesus. I've t I have a teaching on, is Jesus God? And I've showed scriptures, tons of scriptures showing that Jesus is God. But when he came on earth, as the Son of God, he was 100% man. And 100% God at the same time in heaven. But you've got to learn how to separate Jesus God from Jesus man. All right, we need to learn how to do that because a lot of people get confused with that. It's not really hard to understand because, but Jesus, when he was down here, he said, everything I do, I do by my, my father. He didn't say I do it by the, my, the power of God that's in me. But I'm just right here, he says, they call it, he says his name is going to be the mighty God. You know there's only one God. So they, we don't have two gods. And he said the name, his name shall be mighty God. We only have one father. God said his name is going to be the Everlasting Father. So I'm just throwing that in there real quick, showing that Jesus is God, but at the same time when he was here on earth, he became the Son of God. And if that confuses you, get my teaching on, is Jesus God? Get that teaching, and I, 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 I uh, give several scriptures to show that without a doubt that Jesus is God. Philippians 2.9 Wherefore, God hath, hath highly exalted him and given him a name which, above, which is above every name. So the name of Jesus is above every name. Above every name. It's above the president's name. It's anybody, the most important name that you know of, Jesus' name is above that. The Pope, you think that's a high and mighty important name? Well, Jesus' name is above that name. People bow down to the Pope. He's nothing compared to Jesus. His name, Jesus' name, is higher than the Pope. Hebrews 1.4 
being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So even the angels, I mentioned the Pope, that's just a man. But now we're saying that his name is even above the angels. His name is higher than the angels. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All these three are the same. If they weren't the same, then it would say baptizing them in the names. We got three names down here, right? We got Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But if you read, if you read what the verse says, it says baptize them in the name. It didn't say names here. So he's shown right here all three, all three are the same. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, they're all the same. Then you might, you might say, well, who saved me? Well, the Father, he's the one who made the plan of redemption for us. He's the one who had the plan to send his son to die for our sins. Okay, so he saved us, right? He made the plan. But then you look at the son. He's the one who came and died on the cross. If he wouldn't have came and died on the cross and rose on the third day, we wouldn't have salvation. So the Father give, has given it to us. The Son has given it to us. And the Holy Spirit, he lets us know that we need Jesus. In John six forty four, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. So the Holy Spirit is the one that tells you you need a Savior. So all three of them save you. Without the Holy Spirit drawing you, you're not going to get there. In the name, it refers to three offices so you can get saved. It's the entire Godhead. The name saved you. You can't say the Father without Jesus. You can't say Jesus without the Father. You can't say Holy Spirit without all three of them is what saved us. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, of course, we have religions out there that say, well, if you need to get baptized in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But then you got religions out there that says, you just get baptized right here, like it says, in the name of Jesus. Well, what did I just teach you? They're the same. Right. You see, you see why you got different religions? Huh? This is why you got different religions, because they don't read the scriptures. Acts 2.38 and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. But they forget what, what it said in Matthews. They forget that all three of these, Jesus Christ is the Father. Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. So whether you say, I baptize you in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or just in the name of Jesus, you're saying the same thing. That's why this teaching right here has no denomination. I don't. This is not Baptist. This is not Pentecostal. This is not Catholic. Church of Christ, Methodist. We're none of those. We're here just to read the Word of God. And He's given me the, the, the privilege of teaching it to y'all. It's a privilege He's given me. Because I'm just like y'all. I'm a sinner. But that preacher you go listen to, he's a sinner too. Some people think preachers are, with, are without sin. You hear me? But they're sinners just like we are. They're no better than... They're, they're, not, they're not on a higher level. Okay, so now... There are some preachers, they know that. But then there are some preachers that don't know that. They do think they're up here and you're down here. Not in this Bible teaching. I am level with y'all. Just because I'm the one up here doing it, doesn't mean I'm a better person. Doesn't mean that at all. Because I'm a sinner just like y'all. It's just the Lord is using me. And praise God for that. And the scriptures say that. The scriptures do say those and those kind. Like me, I hold this position for the Lord. I'm a teacher. And I am accountable for what I say to y'all. He holds me accountable for what I tell y'all. And preachers are here. It's in, I forgot where it's at, but it's true. Preachers, teachers are held more accountable. And as far as being qualified to preach, there's, there's, there's nothing out in this, in this world that says you have to go to college. You have to go to seminary. And then you're qualified to preach. That's man-made. If you read the Word of God, Paul says, I don't come to you with stuff written on paper, with ink. 
What he's saying, he says, I'm not coming to you with a, some kind of diploma or certificate saying I'm qualified to do this. Paul said, look at the hearts of men where I've been. He said, that's my qualifications. And then in, in the book of uh, Timothy, chapter 3, it does say this. If you want to be a preacher or a teacher, it says these are the qualifications. And nowhere in there does it say you have to go to college. Nowhere in there, in there does it say you got to go to school. So people, I, I made a tape on that also. Because people were asking, what gives you the right to do that? So I made a teaching on it. What does the Bible say qualifies you to preach or teach the Word of God? Not what does, does the Baptists say or the Pentecostals. Not what they say. What does this say? The Bible qualifies you to preach or teach. And if y'all want to know that, it's on CD. Micah 4 or 5. For all people will walk, everyone, in the name of his God. And we will walk in the name of our Lord, our God, forever and ever. So the Lord knew there was going to be people out there with other gods. And they walk in the name of whatever their gods is. Of course, we know they're devil worshippers, and their god is the devil. We know there's people out there that uh, their god is the bald-headed statue guy, man, or whatever he is, Buddha. That's their god. So he and he used in the scriptures. If you look at it, he used a small g. They're not god. They're just gods that man have made. And uh, also, I have to say, Mary. There's people who pray to Mary. Mary is not a god. So don't pray to her. Don't pray to that statue. The statue can't answer your prayer. The devil. Don't pray to the devil. He can't do nothing for you. As we just learned in Job, the only thing he can do is whatever a God allows him to do. He's got to go to our God to tempt us or whatever. He can't just do what he wants with us. As we learned in, as we learned in the book of Job. He's got to go to the Father and say, can I tempt them or whatever. You understand? So there's other gods with a small g. You're not praying in the name if you're asking for stuff that's not in God's will. Praying in the name is when you're being led by the Holy Spirit. Praying in the name is when you're praying in the Holy Spirit. Now there's a prayer of tongues in the Holy Spirit. There is a prayer of tongues. Not everybody does it. It's not a have-to thing. Like some religions teach that you have to speak in tongues. No. The Bible doesn't teach that. But there is a prayer language in tongues that is between you and the Lord. Romans 8.26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. He's saying we don't. sometimes we don't know what to pray. That's what it's saying right here. But then the rest of the verse says, But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with growing which cannot be uttered. So right here it's saying, when you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit knows what to pray. Just let the Holy Spirit take over. But praying in the name is when you're being led by the Holy Spirit. When you're wanting stuff that's out of God's will, then you're not praying in the Spirit. You're not praying in the name. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. I'm just going to say what they mean. I, I didn't put them down there. But Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, you have religious leaders and you have believers in the Lord. The religious leaders pray like they're so righteous. Now this was back in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes. They would pray like they were good enough because they were religious leaders, that they were special and God heard their prayer. That's the way he thought. That God would listen to them because they were righteous, because they were religious leaders. But the believer, he prayed with his head down. He prayed with his head down. He didn't. He felt he wasn't even worthy enough to even ask God for anything. That he wasn't worthy enough, and that's the way he prayed. So you got the religious leader over here. Well, look who I am. I know you're going to hear my prayer because I'm a religious person. Then you got this born again believer over here who, who humbles himself, puts his head down and prays and says, Lord, I'm not worthy of anything. There's the difference between Christianity and religion. All right, there's a difference there. We bow our head. There's a lot of times that when I pray, I really don't know what to pray but to say thank you. That's all, I mean, that's all I know to say because I know how much the Lord has done for me. 
And when I, a lot of times when I get down to pray, all I know to say is thank you. That's all I know to say. The believer, the born again believer, he'll, he, he said in those verses, he said, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Some religious people, leaders, we're talking about religious leaders, preachers. Some of them think they're holy. Again, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to get back on the Pope. But when he drives around in the motorcade and he's shielded with a glass around him and people are throwing roses at him, do you, do you hear me? This guy, this man, is allowing people to <coughs> worship him. They're allowing people to worship. He is allowing them to worship him. Paul and Peter which I've taught this a couple of weeks back, when people came to worship them, right away they stepped back and said, no, you don't worship me. I'm just like you. Do you hear the Pope saying that? I'm sorry, but for you Catholics who are listening to this CD, that's just the truth. I'm going to give you the word of God. That's why last week, I think it was, it says a prophet isn't even welcome in his own home. That's talking about a preacher. That's why. They wanted to kill Jesus was in the church. Jesus was in the church preaching. Jesus. Not a preacher. Not We're talking about Jesus himself was in the church preaching. And he offended the people so bad. They took him to the hill to throw him over the hill to kill him. So us preachers or teachers. This is not a popular job we have. Ministry. It's not a job. It's a ministry. This is not a popular ministry for us. Because a lot of people are not going to like what this says. Not what we say. Because preachers or teachers are going to teach you this if they're men of God. Now, there's preachers and teachers out there that preach what they think, their opinion. Now, they might get along with people liking them. And they have a lot like that. These big old churches with all these members, well, they're there because the preacher ain't stepping on their toes. The preacher ain't giving them the truth. Do you hear me? Because if the preacher was giving them the truth, I guarantee you a lot of people would leave just like they did with Jesus. But I know I'm a sinner. And this, this believer in, in, chapter, in uh, Luke chapter 18, he says, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. We'll, Christians, will, they will do recognize that we're sinners. We do recognize that. All right? Religious people, they think if their good outweighs their bad. You hear me? Oh, I'm not such a bad guy or person. That's not what this sinner said here. He said, I am a sinner. And this is a believer. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that would I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now right here, and other verses that I'm going to read, we got to know what he's talking about. When he says, when you ask for anything... 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we received of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. The secret here, and it's not a secret. Whatsoever we ask, we receive from him. Why? It says it right there. Why will we receive whatever we ask from him? It says because we will keep his commandments. If we're in the Lord, if we're walking with the Lord, and pleasing to his sight, that means we're walking in God's will. Is it God's will for you to be rich? Is it his will for you to be rich? Instead of out there witnessing to people? It's God's will, and that's what he put us here for, is to go out and tell the lost people about him. We got to, right here it says, keep his commandments. What's his commandments? Are we over here asking for a lot of money, but yet we don't, we hate our enemy instead of love our enemy? Is that keeping his commandments? Do you understand what I'm saying? He said, I will do, I will give you. But he says, but you got to keep my commandments. So don't be asking for stuff if you're not keeping his commandments because then, he, then he's not going to give you what you want. But if you're walking with the Lord, he'll give you what you want because you're walking with the Lord. And when you're walking with the Lord, you're not going to be a glutton. Give me this, give me that. You're not, gonna, not when you're walking with the Lord. John 16, 23. And in that day we shall ask me, and in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask in the Father, in my name, he will give it. Right up above, he says, the reason we ask in his name is to glorify the Son. Are you glorifying the Son when you say, hey, I want a big uh, jaguar? 
Huh? Are you glorifying the Son, or is that glorifying you? Do, do you see what I'm saying? Do you hear? Do you read the scriptures? Do people read the scriptures? I'm, I'm serious. When you got preachers out there saying, "Oh, whatever you want, ask for it," because we got the it says it in the Bible. Just ask. I mean, you got preachers on TV that do that. And if you don't get it, it's your fault. That's what they preach. Well, if you don't get it, it's because either you don't have enough faith to God, that, 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 that God will give it to you. No, there are reasons when God says, I will just ask and I'll give it to you. And all those times are is, is when you're in his will. When you're in God's will, you're not going to be greedy and envy and want this and want that. Do you hear me? Instead, you're going to be asking, Lord, give me more power. Give me more power to be out to be out there in the world to witness to people. This is this is what's pleasing to the Lord, because that's what it says in John three twenty two. And do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Scriptures are pretty simple, aren't they? I mean, I just read them to you. I just read the verses to you. They're pretty simple what they say, ain't it? But when you take one verse and you don't read the rest of it, well, you can take that verse and make it mean just about anything you want. And that's what we have a lot of. We have a lot of preachers who are doing that. And most of them are called wolves. The Bible tells you all about wolves. They're out there. They look. They act. They speak just like real men of God. And they're hard to separate. And the Lord says that if it, was poss- if it were possible, he could fool even us, the born-again Christian. That's how close they are. But they're wolves. That's why I tell you all the time, don't even, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Because you don't know when you're in front of a wolf. Because a wolf don't look like a wolf. You hear me? A wolf looks like a man of God, but he's a counterfeit. Know what's in here. And I tell you all the time, take these scriptures that I give y'all, take them home, read them. Make sure I didn't take these scriptures out of context to make them mean something else. Test, test me. Make sure I'm a man of God. Because I could be a wolf. Well, look at Jesse. He's wearing that jacket and his hair's comb and he's shaving and he's using the Bible, the scriptures to speak to us. Wolves do that. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful. Because there's a lot of wolves out there. And there are a lot of them on TV. I'll tell Christians that 24-hour network on TV... TBN or whatever it's called, half of what's on there, and I'm going to tell you, half of what's on there is wolves. But if we, but if we don't read this, we think they're men of God because they look and sound very religious. The third commandment in the Bible, the third commandment out of the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So plainly what it's saying here, don't play with the name of God. Don't play with it. And there's people who do it. People who want to get their way on doing something, they'll say, God told me to do this. That's using the Lord's name in vain. And then the Lord takes that very serious. Right here he says it. He'll take that very serious. Don't play with the name of the Lord. Don't say he's told you to do something and he really didn't, but you used it. So nobody, because if you say the Lord told me to do it, Who's going to question you? You know, who's going to question you? That's kind of, that's kind of hard to question. Because if the person says, God told me to do it, well, who are we to tell him, no, he didn't? Now, there's a lot of times it is true. Yes, God did tell whatever, whoever, you know, to do something. But there are people out there who says, well, the Lord told me to go to Africa or to go to, the mission, to missions overseas. The Lord didn't tell them. They just want to do that. But they'll say, God told me to do it. That's using the Lord's name in vain. Because I know people who's done That's why I can say it. I know people who's done that. That's because that's what they wanted to do. So they'll say, God sent me. Or God told me to go. Half those missionaries out there, half of them are not sent by God. They're sent by people's own will to go. They want to go. They want to leave here and go somewhere. Because other people are paying for it. But when you do that, God says right here not to use his name in vain. And if you do, I wouldn't want God after me for doing it. You understand what I'm saying? 
how would we know, like, if we see somebody do that, how do we know the difference between somebody just saying, God said, God told me to do this from, you know, like you say, you don't do anything unless you hear it from God. How do we know the difference if like, they're saying, oh, God said, God told me to do this, if they're really serious that God told them to do it? Well, the reason I say that, I can say that, is because I've seen young people, young people, say, the Lord wants me to go over there and teach. Young people. Well, one of the qualifications for being a teacher or a preacher, is the Bible says they can't be young. So right there, I see that's wrong. Because if it's a young, a young person who wants to go there and says, God's sending me over there, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Or if it's a married woman, and I know some married women, they, they leave their house to go on missions. That's against the Word of God. Which we'll learn that when we when we get on the marriage teachings. We'll learn that. But things like that that I see, that I hear, I know right then and there, I know that's not of God. I know it because that's going against what God says. And that's why I can say that. Not on all of them. I can't say it on all of them because, you know, if it's a man like me and, and he says, the Lord sent me, sending me to Africa, whatever, well, I, you know, I can't say nothing because I don't know if he did or not. But when I see him, when I see these young kids saying, God wants me to go over there, they haven't even grown in the Lord themselves here, and God's going to go send them over there? No. Okay. So y'all understand what I'm saying now? But that's, that's taking the Lord's name in vain, is when you use his name to, so you can do what you want to do. John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you, you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, right here, he's speaking about bearing fruit. Again, it's one of those, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Well, if you read the verses, especially verse 8, it says, Herein my Father glorifies that ye bear much fruit. So what he's saying here is, is what he's asking for is he wants to bear more fruit. Give me what I need to bear more fruit. That's what he's asking for. So all these preachers who go around using these verses, they say right here it says, ask whatever you want and he'll do it. You got to see what, what is that chapter talking about? In this chapter right here, this person is asking for more fruit. That's what he's asking for. John fifteen sixteen, a little further down. Ye have chosen me, but I have chosen, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. That ye shall go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Again, he's talking about the fruit. But you take verses like this, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. They take those verses and just, if you don't have a big house, it's because you didn't ask for it. Because they'll read verses like that and, and you'll say, well, He's reading the scriptures, but he's reading one verse. I'm telling you, these verses, I'm telling you what the chapter is talking about. John 5.43 I am come in my Father's name, and ye, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. So there's going to be people out there, just like the verse I read before, they're going to have other gods, and there's going to be other names out there. Other names. There's other names. And like I said before, people, everybody, just about everybody, they want something to have faith in. That's why they have other gods. And right here it says, if somebody else comes in another name, they'll take it. They'll take it because they want to have faith in something. That's why we, the born-again Christians, should be out there reaching these people. Because the devil worshipers are. Those worshipers are out there trying to recruit more to come into their little cult. Look at the Jehovah Witnesses. I'm not saying they're devil worshipers, but they're not of God. Not when they take the Word of God. Now, this is Jehovah Witnesses. When they take the Word of God and find mistakes in this Bible, the King James Bible, when they say, oh, there's mistakes in here, and they correct them and they write another Bible, that is not a, that is not a church of God. There's no man here on earth can say, that's a mistake in the Bible. God wrote this book. But Jehovah's Witnesses, no, they, they said, no, there's mistakes. That why, that's why we have this book. Mm -hmm. All right? Same thing with the Mormons. 
You see the Mormon commercials. They're good. They're really good. You would think, oh, for sure, these are, these are people of God. Why do you think they have the Book of Mormons? Did the Lord say there was the Bible and the Book of Mormons? No, this is the Word of God right here. There's no other book. The Book of Mormons was written by the Mormons. It wasn't written by God. But you see how they can fool you? I mean, I've seen the commercials, the Latter-day Saints. I've seen those commercials. Man, they're good. They're wolves. That's why I say be careful. It's hard to recognize a wolf from a real man of God. It's hard, I'm telling you. And the only way you're going to do it is by doing this, studying, coming to Bible teachings, go to church, hearing a preacher. That's the only way you're going to learn. That's the way I've learned. Colossians 3.17 and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So whatever we do, in word or in deed, whatever we say or whatever we do, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And why do we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus? Because I am Jesse. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. What does Christian mean? Christ-like. I have taken on the name of Jesus Christ. I have taken his name by saying I'm a Christian. So if I'm taking his name, that's very, very... So you don't play with that. If you call yourself a Christian, you better be a Christian. You better be a Christian. Just like it said in the... Not to use the Lord's name in vain. We're Christ. And we're Christ-like, so that's why we're called Christians. We call yourself a Christian and you're not a Christian? Be careful. Now we're going to learn the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. This is the Lord's Prayer. It says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our dead earths. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's the Lord's Prayer. Now when you go to pray at night, is this what you're supposed to do? Just read this? Where's prayer come from? Prayer comes from the heart. The Lord didn't say, read this when you pray. This is what you say when you pray. No, this is a sample prayer. And what he's saying here in verse 9, you begin prayer with, with worship. Our Father. You're recognizing God Almighty. You're recognizing Him as your Father. That way when, you, when you're praying, He knows you're talking to Him. Our Father which art in heaven. Is Buddha in heaven? There's a lot of little gods with the small g. They're not in heaven. But our, right here, our Father is in heaven. We know He's in heaven. We go by this. It says in it, he's in heaven. So that's why we start our prayer, our Father which is in heaven. Not our Father which sits on, on a throne down here. So we're recognizing who our Father is. Our Father is the one that's in heaven. If you were to listen to all the great prayers in the Bible, they begin this way. They begin with recognizing who God is. That's how they begin. Acts chapter 4, verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. So right here, they, they started recognizing who he is. He's the one who made everything, right? But recognize him as that. You're the father who made the heavens and the earth. All them stories you see, your father made them. This big old earth we live in, your father made them. And he's done a lot. This air that you breathe is from him. That sun that keeps you warm, that's from him. Recognize these things. Don't. These are things that we take for granted. These are not. The, don't take these things for granted. What did the Lord do in the Bible one time? He took the sun away for 24 hours. The Lord controls the sun. He controls the sea. He he controls the wind. You hear me? God controls that. This is not something we just take for granted and, oh, it's supposed to be there. God put it there. And just like he put it there, he can take it away. 
So don't take these things for granted. But this is how we recognize him. We begin with praise and worship on recognizing who he is. Just saying our father has a lot of power behind it. When you say our father or when you're praying, right here it says our father because he's talking to Christians. But we, when we pray, we say my father, my Lord. You make it more personal. It makes it very personal when you say our father. Also, you're, you're directing your prayer to him first before you start asking him whatever you're praying him for. You know, if you're wanting something or whatever, before you put yourself first, you put him first. This is what this prayer is showing, that you put God first. Recognize him first. Worshiping and getting in his presence. Like I said the other night, you got to get in the presence of the Lord. I mean, get it, get it. I mean, you got to shut yourself out from everything. And, and it's like, just close your eyes and just picture him being right there, right, right here, right in front of you. And it's just you and him. That's how you pray. Recognize first you worship him. Put him right there in your presence. Then speak to him. But a lot of times we go to him and the first thing we do is, Lord, I need. God, I want. We don't even recognize who he is. We go straight into us. Matthew 6, 8. For the Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. So before you even ask him what you need, he already knows it. Matthew 6, 8 tells you right here. He says, before you even ask for it, he already knows you need it. Go ahead and start worshiping him and praising him because he already knows what you want. So put yourself last because he already knows what you want. Just go ahead and start praising him, worshiping him in, in your prayer first. And praying. You know, if we pray for 30 minutes, like I said the other night, if we pray for 30 minutes, we think we've done something. Ooh, we prayed to the Lord. Well, I prayed for a whole 30 minutes. I showed him scriptures where the Lord prayed all night. All night. Do you hear me? He prayed all night. And we think we're doing something great when we pray for 30 minutes or more. Jesus prayed all night, many times. That's when you really are getting into the Spirit. That's when you're really in God's presence. Probably half, probably half the night was just praising Him. He probably for half a night just praised Him for who He was, who He is. Matthew 6, 7, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Don't get me wrong. Catholics people, I love. Catholic people, I love. The Catholic religion, I don't. Because the Catholic religion takes you away from God and onto a lot of traditional statues, candles, all this other stuff. That's what they point you to. Well, do this and do this. That's why I don't like that religion. And there are some Catholic people in the Catholic Church who are Christians. I'm saying a lot about the Catholics, but also at the same time, let me let you know that there are Christians in the Catholic Church. And maybe they're there to reach other people, just like Peter and Paul. They became like the group, whatever people they were written, witnessing to, they became like them so they could witness to them. I'm a Baptist. I go to the. I am not a Baptist, but I go to the Baptist church. But I'm there hoping I can reach the Baptists and pull them away from uh, some of the things that are. There's some things the Baptists do that's not biblical, but every every religion is that way. There's things Pentecostals do, Church of Christ, all of them do something. But I'm there hoping to show those Baptists there is such a thing as moving in the spirit, that you can get excited. That you can raise your hands in church and glorify the Lord. That you don't have to be sitting there like a bump on a log. If you're getting the word of God and your spirit receives it, there's going to be action. And that's why I'm, I'm there in that church <coughs> to show the Baptist, hey, there is such a thing as moving in the spirit. That's why I'm saying there might be some Christians in the Catholic church that are there hoping to reach those who are really into the, the traditions of a Catholic. Hope I, I hope you all understand what I'm saying. Hallow be thy name. Hallow be thy name. Jesus' name. means means he's set apart from everybody and everything. That name is unique. There's no other name like it. Hallowed. Holy is that name. So when you pray, recognize that name that you're using is very holy. There is no other name like that. The Lord's Prayer doesn't make, it doesn't say it makes us holy. It says God is holy. And he is the only holy. 
Not your priest, not your pope, not your preacher, and not your teacher. We're not hollow. We're not holy. Only your Father in heaven is holy. It says when you're praying, like Matthew 6.33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's just another verse shown. Seek him first. Always put the Lord first in your prayer, in your life. Always put him first. And then when you're walking with him, then these things shall be added unto you. A Christian does not have to go without needs. If you're a Christian and you're walking with the Lord, you will have a roof, you will have food, and you will have clothes. No if, ends, or, or if you're walking with the Lord, you will not go without these. I guarantee you, if you're walking with the Lord, you're, you're not going to go without any of this stuff. He will supply all your needs when you're walking with him. All your needs. Did I say some? I said all your needs. When you're walking with the Lord, he'll supply all your needs. Did I say once? No, I said needs. And when you're praying to the Lord, you got to be in agreement with what he says in this word. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? How can you walk with the Lord if there's things in here you don't agree with them? How can, you, how can we be together with the Lord if there's things in here that we don't agree with? You can only be a Christian by fully, 100% believing everything that's in this book. Everything. 100%. This is God to us. This, we can't see him. So this is it right here. His, this is his words. So this is our Lord. We, not this book. Not these paper. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the words. The spiritual words that come out to us. That's our God. That's what we see. And unless we're in total agreement with this. Amos 3.3 3 says, how can we walk together? In verse 11 and 12, that's when it goes into, okay, now we pray for us. Now, in verse 11, it says, give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread. How many times have y'all prayed, said that, and you don't know what you're talking about? The Lord said, concentrate on this day. Don't worry about tomorrow. There's other places in the Bible, and I've, I've taught them, where God says, don't worry about tomorrow. He says, I've got tomorrow under control. That's what he said. And right here in the Lord's Prayer, it says it. Give us this day. He didn't say give us this week or give us this month or give us this year. No, he said right here, he said, he's saying give us this day our daily bread. Lord, take care of me today. What I need for today, take care of me. Did y'all see that? Did y'all see that? Today. We, we walk with the Lord day by day. Why? Because are you guaranteed you're going to be here tomorrow? None of us are guaranteed that we're going to be here tomorrow. Something can happen tonight to someone. Or the Lord could come tonight. So why are you worried about tomorrow if it's not even going to get here for some of us? And when I say some of us, I'm not talking about just in this room. I'm not saying no, somebody's going to die tonight. <laughs> I'm just talking about Christians, okay? But why are we worried about tomorrow when it's not even going to be here for some of us? And like I said, and we don't know when he's coming. All these idiots that are saying he's going to come here or he's going to come on this date or this date. Yes, I call them idiots because that's what they are. The Bible plainly says no man knows the hour, the day, or the hour. And why they keep trying to figure it out, I don't know. Idiots. I'm sorry, but that's what I call them is idiots. And also in those, and it says we ask the Lord to forgive us. Now, how many of us in here know we don't have to sin every day? We're not perfect. But do you know that Christians can go days without sinning? Did you know that? We can go days without sinning. Well, yeah, I mean, we're not going to be sinless because we're not perfect yet. We're not going to be sinless until we go be with the Lord. Okay, then we'll be sinless. Then we'll be just like him without sin. But as long as we're here on this earth, yes, we're going to sin. But people think, well, you know, it, it, that's what we're going to do. We're sinners. Yeah, we're sinners, but that doesn't, the, we don't have to be sinners every day. The Bible says, be ye perfect like I am perfect. We're not, as long as we're here on earth, we can't be completely perfect like him, but we can strive to be perfect. And we can go, uh, I don't know if it's days or weeks or even months, but we do not, we do not have to sin every day in our, in our lives because, well, you know, I'm still in this body, this sinful body. Uh-uh. Don't believe that. 
We're sinners, but nowhere in the Bible does it say we're going to sin every day. When you're walking with the Lord, you can go days, I'm telling you. Well, that's kind of hard, no? It's not. When you're walking with the Lord, it's not hard to do. For religious people, it's hard to do. You know why? Because they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in them. And they're over there gritting their teeth. I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. I'm not, you know. That's when you're doing it on your own power. When you're having to grit your teeth from doing it. But when you're just walking with the Lord and you got your eyes on the Lord. You're, you're not doing sin and you don't even recognize you're not doing it. Because you got your eyes on the Lord. So when you wake up in the morning and you do what Psalm says to meditate on day and night. Because you got your eyes on You're waking up and the first thing you do is you put your eyes on the Lord. And you keep them there. You meditate on them. Day and night. That's what Psalm says. He doesn't say you're going to be sinless, but you can go days without sinning. Amen? I would say that's an amen. Again, now in verse 13, again, again, we recognize him as being the king over the universe. We recognize him as having all power and to glorify him. So we end, we begin the prayer worshiping him, and then we put our little bit in the middle, and then we end prayer by worshiping him. That's what the Lord the Lord's Prayer, that's what it teaches us. <clears throat> when you read the Bible, you'll find many, many, many places. When they prayed, they gave glory to God. All prayer in the Bible is from the heart. It's not a poem. It's not a quote. It's not reading. I mean, you see preachers out there, they say, let us, you, they say, let's pray, and they're reading. That's not prayer. Prayer comes from here. Amen.